Recognizing the member for Port Moody Coquitlam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm uh, honored today to, to stand in the House and say uh, a few words about the uh, 2024 budget. This will be our, our um, final budget before the next election. And it's a budget that directly tackles some of the biggest challenges that families in BC are facing today. It includes affordability, housing, health care, and building a strong, clean economy. These challenges, Madam Speaker, that families are facing today are a direct result of the mismanagement and reckless cuts to services over 16 years of the BC Liberal government. Make no mistake, these challenges are made worse by global inflation. But the people that were there Madam Speaker, the people that were there during that time, you have to remember that immediately when they they became government, they cut $4.4 billion from the budget. What's the impact of that? We're still feeling the effects of that today. And the same people that were there at that time making those cuts to services supporting families are the same people that claim they have the solutions to fix those problems. They're they're on the other side of the House, the very same people, Madam Speaker. Our budget that we put together is put together with a different philosophy than that. It's a different philosophy than that previous government that they had at that time and that they have today. The primary philosophy, Madam Speaker, is putting people first. We say to the people of British Columbia that we've got your back. We're here with you to tackle these challenges. We're here to work with you to address the problems created by the previous government. And we're doing it in a way that leads the country economically and financially. Madam Speaker, you have to remember that our debt to GDP ratio is the third lowest in the country. We're addressing these challenges and we're doing it in a fiscally responsible way. And our economy is leading the country as well. I'll say a few words about about the economy, Madam Speaker, because um, it's... uh, a few details that I think would be important to share, just in terms of where we're at today economically. So we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country, 5.4%. That's below the national average. In the last year, we've gained over 70,000 jobs. And that's some of the strongest private sector job growth in the country. And strong self-employment growth as well. Between 2017 and 2022, we had the highest GDP growth among large provinces at 14.4%. We recorded the highest average hourly wages in the country. That's where we're at right now. From 2017 to 2023, our exports increased by 30%. And from 2017 to 2023, women's employment grew by over 100,000. We're leading the the country, Madam Speaker, economically. And it's it's because of the way we we tackle these things. The, The philosophy on the other side, the philosophy on the other side is to cut taxes for the top 2% and then willy nilly cut services. To, balance the, to try to balance the budget. Cutting funding here and there and everywhere just to, just to try to make those numbers work. Cut, you know, pull money from ICBC, pull money from BC Hydro, just try to, try to make it work somehow. That's, that's their philosophy. But the, the problem, 
The problem with that, the problem with that is it affects people. It affects the people in British Columbia. When you, when you just cut services, you cut funding to, to health care and education and across the board mental health. Madam Speaker, like, to, just to give you an example of where things, like, let's just look at what happened. Well, before I get to that, actually, Madam Speaker, why don't, why don't we talk about, why don't we start with affordability? Why don't we start with what we're doing in this budget and kind of contrast a little bit to how things were done previously? So one of the biggest uh, you know, challenges people are facing is, is around affordability. And there are so many initiatives that our government has been undertaking to try to help um, with, with affordability, one of which is the uh, BC Family Benefit. In this budget, uh, we're including a $248 million one-year BC Family Benefit bonus starting in July. So what does that mean? That for a family of four, just to give you an example, a family of four would receive up to $2,850. And then with the bonus that we're putting in this year on top of that, that would rise to as much as $3,563. That's a family of four. On average, families, this is an average, families will receive $445 more um, with this budget. There's approximately 66,000 more families will receive the benefit and the bonus this year. That's 340,000 families in this province that will benefit during 12 month period. That's, that's the philosophy that we're undertaking. We recognize the challenges that people are facing and we want to address these challenges by working with families, working with people across the province. If you contrast this to how families, how children, how young people were affected by the budget of the previous government, just as an example, they, in their, in their time, cut $187 million from child protection and family development. They cut $34.5 million from youth justice and youth services and youth and child mental health. They cut $15.6 million in childhood development and special needs services for kids. Just trying to find little areas that can pull money out of the budget because they, they had to do that, that tax cut to the rich. But that, there are many other initiatives that we're undertaking in this budget, one of which is the BC Electricity Affordability Credit. That's uh, up to $100 on your BC Hydro bill that you're going to get credited back. We're also um, in increasing the Climate Action Tax Credit. 100% of that revenue that comes in from, from, that, from the carbon tax increase will be directed into the climate, ta climate action tax credit. And again, looking at, a, at an example, family of four will receive $890 last year and $1,005 this year. More than, the, I mean, the majority of people in British Columbia will receive more money back from this climate action ta tax credit than they'll, pl than they'll pay from carbon tax. And the, and the go our goal is to reach 80% um, of uh, households in BC by 2030 um, that would uh, receive, receive, receive this credit. Also in this budget, Madam Speaker, uh, renters will see it up to $400 come back uh, through the BC renters, renters tax credit. And, and that's also that I'm not even mentioning the funding that we're providing for 
child care, something that was also cut by the previous government. And, and just to look at uh, an example of, apart from all of, all of these additions in this budget, Madam Speaker, the, if you look at the overall, the net provincial tax that a family is paying, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's no longer Madam Speaker, it's Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, so let, let's take a family with a low income, $30,000 a year. In 2016, that, that family, when you add up all of the, the taxes they have to pay, would have, would have had to pay a low tax of $177 back in 2016. Today, they actually get a refund of $2,420, another, another way that we can help support families in British Columbia. But even at the higher end of the income spectrum, families that are making $100,000 in 2016, their net provincial tax was $7,473. Today, it's $4,630. So all of this that we keep hearing from, I mean, they say it a lot, it's like all these taxes, all these taxes. You can count up numbers of taxes, but the the net tax, the net tax that a family pays in this province is far lower today than it was under that previous government. Like, imagine that. That we can actually lower taxes and provide the services that families need in this province. That's how you run a government. So another area, Madam Speaker, that I can talk about in this budget is housing. This budget introduces a home flipping tax. So this home flipping tax will become effective in January. It will be a tax on the profit made from selling residential property within two years of buying it. So we're one of many initiatives that we're undertaking to try to curb uh, speculation and make sure that homes are for people, not, not for investment. For speculators. I mean, this builds on, uh, you know, we're changing short-term rentals so that we can't, um, it takes away that incentive to buy property just to rent it out as an Airbnb. We want those properties to be lived in by families, by people. We're expanding the, the speculation tax. We're capping rent increases below inflation. And we're also, we also put together a rental protection fund to help preserve um, housing that is older stock that, again, has been the target of investors that want to come in and uh, buy up the property and redevelop it to much more expensive um, housing units than, than are there. We're, we're working to protect those units. The, a contrast this, Madam Speaker, to what happened under the previous government. Now, there's a lot of talk about housing affordability, and it is a challenge. We have to remember that during the time of the BC Liberal leadership, the average price of a home went, went from less than 400000 to more than 1.8 million in February of 2016. That's an increase of over 350%. What, was, what, was, what happened during that time was an incredible amount of speculation that came into the market. Housing prices in Vancouver rose 200% faster than New York, and many other, and, and even more than, than most other cities. You have to remember, this is the time when Christy Clark went to China with at least three real estate firms to promote housing speculation in BC. That's, that's why we're dealing with this issue today. 
No, because of speculation that was allowed to grow under the previous government. And they, they don't, some of them are new, they don't really know the history, I guess, but it, it is something that, that we are working to address, and it's a challenge. It's a challenge worldwide, but uh, we're taking it very seriously with our initiatives that we're putting in place. So the, uh, the next part that I'm going to talk about here is some of the initiatives to help with home ownership, some other initiatives in this budget, one of which is um, property transfer tax exemptions. Uh, we have a first time home buyers program and we are uh, raising the, uh, the amount of the, uh, for a home up to $835,000, the first 500,000 is completely exempt from property transfer tax. It, our goal there is to try to help um, young families and young um, new homeowners to get into the market. So pr people purchasing newly constructed homes worth up to 1.1 million will also see lower costs uh, through the newly built home ex exemption. Of course, there's also BC Builds. The Homes for People plan uh, is getting $198 million in new funding for BC Builds. That'll help create more middle income housing for families and people. And there are another, a number of other initiatives around housing, obviously, that, that are underway as well. This is a major part of our work as government to try to address the affordability crisis in housing. Um, the next area I want to talk about is health care and, and services. The, the budget uh, provides over $8 billion over three years to strengthen health care, uh, K-12 education, justice and public safety, and to also help people who need care and support. The number of initiatives that are undertaken in health care is also uh, not, not just this budget, but we've, we've created a new contract for family doctors. We're seeing a net new increase in family doctors, quite substantial, 900 new family doctors within the last year. Thousands of new nurses um, uh, with allowing some changes in international credentials, helping there as well. We're also um, investing not just in, um, in the services, but in the capital investments as well. $13 billion over the next three years to support construction of long-term care, acute care, and cancer care facilities. We're getting new cancer care facilities in Surrey, Burnaby, Nanaimo, and Kamloops, just, just to, to name a few. We are uh, adding $227 million for home health care services, $127 million for community-based services such as Better at Home, which supports seniors on day-to-day -day tasks. We're also funding first round of in vitro fertilization. That's gonna be starting in April, 2025. We're investing in mental health and addictions, $117 million to continue funding more than 2,200 community mental health and substance use treatment beds and more than 300 health authority and community care facilities. $49 million to support existing harm reduction initiatives at 49 overdose, overdose prevention sites. $39 million to fund peer-existed peer care teams and mobile integrated crisis response teams. Those were recommendations that came out of the, um, uh, the Committee to Reform the Police Act that I was, that I was happy to be part of. And, well, before I get on to education, let, let's, let's take a look at, Madam Speaker, 
how does this like how does this compare to what they did? They they well. There, there's so many things that they did. In the 300, I think it was $360 million that they cut from the budget and health care during the time that the, the leader of the opposition was um, health minister. And, uh, but we, um, we are continuing to support the health care sector with our, with our budget and also the, uh, the K-12 uh, schools. Last year was a big year. There's 13,000 more students that, that enrolled in, in schools in British Columbia. So budget, our budget this year invests almost a billion dollars for more staff in classrooms to support this, this growing, uh, this growth in, in children entering into our school system. Students will also be supported with $225 million for the Classroom Enhancement Fund to hire more teachers, including special education teachers, teachers, psychologists, and counselors. And $4.2 billion in capital investments to build, renovate, and upgrade schools for seismic upgrades and for playgrounds uh, over the next three years in this capital plan as well. Now, under the previous government, they, they actually shut down 197 schools during their time in government. Now we're struggling to like, bring these schools back. This is, again, another example of how we're trying to address the challenges that we're facing today that were created by the previous government. They cut $100 million from education in, in their 2012 budget, the year that the leader of the opposition was, was fin finance minister. What effect did that have on students from that point forward? Imagine the, the things that had to be cut from our children's classrooms, just to like, just, just from, a, from the decision to, to eliminate $100 million from, from their budgets. It, was, it affected people. Let me move on to just trying to uh, pace this out in a way that I can get, cover all these topics. Um, let me move on to uh, our work to build a cleaner economy that supports people. It's a work to strengthen our economy and to invest in climate action. Our Clean BC program is, is well known and this budget supports our commitment to climate action with $318 million to continue to fund grant and rebate programs for clean transportation, energy efficient buildings and communities and support the transition to a low carbon economy. Now there's another $40 million for heat pump rebates for low and middle income families, $20 million for active transportation grants uh, to communities and $30 million to continue the implementation of our electric vehicle charging uh, infrastructure. Climate change is obviously something that is, is going to get worse. It is a primary moral obligation of government to take action on climate change. Meanwhile, Madam, Mr. Speaker, meanwhile, on the other side, there's, there's almost a competition to see who believes less in climate change between the opposition party and the BC Conservative Fourth Party. They're, they're trying to one-up each other in terms of their interest in, in outdoing each other in, in stepping back from commitments on, on taking action on climate change. It's ironic, the, the leader of the, the fourth party was kicked out of the caucus because he expressed views that questioned whether climate change was real. And yet, the leader of the opposition has publicly stated that, yeah, it's okay if, if you don't believe. In, in their caucus, 
it's okay if you don't believe that climate change is, is real or not, as long as you don't talk about it publicly. That, that's, that's, what, that's what the leader of, of the BCUP party is saying. Our children are inheriting the world that we are leaving to them. And for some reason, it's, there's a lack of interest and a lack of understanding that we need to be taking action on climate change on the other side of the house. They don't seem to understand it. And meanwhile, we're facing unprecedented flooding events from atmospheric rivers, you know, the, the Nooksack River flooding that happened in 2021, cost over a billion dollars. There is a cost to that. Our, the forest fires that, that are you know, raging across the province nearly at, like every summer now with increasing frequency, there is a cost to climate change. And we have the moral responsibility to take action on that. We're also investing in emergency management to deal with, to help deal with these challenges. That's in the budget as well. $405 million more over four years to bol bolster the province's capacity to prepare for and respond to future climate emergencies. This includes 154 million in operating and 21 million in capital funding to support additional wildfire response, recovery and infrastructure resources following BC's record wildfire, wildfire season uh, in this last year. So Madam Speaker, <laughs> why do I keep saying Madam Speaker? I'm so sorry. I, I just got it. It's an honor. You can also say honored speaker, <laughs> I, honorable speaker, I, Mr. I, speaker. I just don't call me late for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize for that. I, I started with that, and then I just can't seem to to change my uh, my uh, my pronouns on that one. So, um, so anyway, uh, Mr. Speaker, I am honored to um, to be part of a government that puts people first. When we think about putting our budget together. We are doing it from the perspective that we understand the challenges that people are facing. We know how hard it can be, whether it's families, but also like small businesses. We're, we're there for small businesses as well. We want to have this economy be strong to support families and create jobs in a, in a clean economy. And we can do, and we're doing that. The, the efforts that we're putting in around Clean BC are paying off. We, we are becoming global leaders on the new clean economy of the future. And I, I'm so proud to be part of a government that recognizes the importance of taking that action and investing in a new direction, in re investing in an in a economy of the future. We, we, can, we don't have to go back, backwards. Uh, the government that was there before, we don't have to go back to that. We can keep looking forward. We can keep looking ahead to a bright future. We can keep looking ahead to a future that is better for all British Columbians. And I'm uh, very excited that we've had this opportunity and I hope we have that opportunity to continue this good work so thank you, Mr. Speaker.